Good afternoon. I want to thank everybody for joining us uh, here today to talk about Senate Bill 509 and a provision that would make its impact even more catastrophic than <coughs> first thought. Each day we see more examples of how our strategic, fiscally responsible approach is moving Missouri's economy forward. The number one state for technology job growth in the nation for the last two years running. Faster job growth in seven out of eight neighboring states. And major investment by global brands and small businesses alike. But right now, our economy, as the rock solid foundation of fiscal certainty on which it rests, is at risk. As you know, the responsibility I have as governor to read and thoroughly review every bill that comes to my desk is one I take very seriously. This process is important because this assessment is the last safeguard against flawed legislation becoming the law of the land. Last week, we began our review of Senate Bill 509 and quickly identified a dramatic and far-reaching problem that was not discussed during the public debate about this legislation in the General Assembly. Senate Bill 509, as truly agreed to and finally passed by the legislature, would eliminate income tax on Missourians with income greater than $9,000 a year. That's right, eliminate. Let me explain. Missouri's tax code contains a number of brackets or ranges of income subject to certain levels of taxation. Currently, the top bracket includes all Missourians with incomes over $9,000 a year. Senate Bill 509 says that once this legislation is fully phased in, the top bracket, quote, shall be eliminated. The result of this provision would be to wipe out 97% of all individual income tax collections in the state of Missouri. Given the cataclysmic nature of this provision, we immediately sought an outside independent review to verify our analysis. Washington University law professor Cheryl Block is an expert on individual and corporate tax policy. In fact, she wrote the book on this topic as her textbook on corporate taxation is now in its fourth Edition. For more than 30 years, she has taught classes on tax law, legislation, and statutory interpretation. Professor Block's analysis confirmed that Senate Bill 509 would, quote, completely eliminate the top state personal income tax bracket, and as a result, taxpayers with incomes over $9,000 a year would pay no tax at all. Following this outside legal review, we then had State Budget Director Linda Lubering and the professional staff at the Office of Budget and Planning conduct an analysis of the fiscal impact of this provision. The results were staggering. This provision would cost $4.8 billion, $4.8 billion a year when fully implemented, wiping out 65% of the state's general revenue budget and ultimately pushing Missouri into fiscal chaos. It is hard to overstate the crippling impact this would have. Senate Bill 509 would force the outright elimination of the most basic services Missourians count on from their government. Teachers would be laid off and schools would shut their doors. Prisons would close. Mental health facilities would be shut. Down. And the AAA credit rating would be boasted and boosted for decades would be downgraded. With a simple stroke of my pen, this bill would separate Missouri from every other state in the nation as the only one unable to meet even the most basic obligations to its people. The consequence of a fiscal disaster on this scale will be devastating, and because of the Hancock Amendment, extremely difficult to undo were this bill to become law. That Senate Bill 509 would have catastrophic implications on Missouri families and schools, really there's no question. The only question is how something of this magnitude ended up in a five-page bill that passed both chambers of the legislature without debate or public discussion of this problem. There are only two plausible explanations, and both are equally troubling. Either this provision was an accident, another example of carelessness by legislators unwilling to dedicate the time and effort necessary to avoid grave errors like this, or this provision was placed in the bill deliberately at the behest of ideological interests led by one single billionaire. These interests have long been determined to shift the tax burden away from themselves and onto middle class families by eliminating the income tax entirely. Whether the result of gross negligence or purposeful effort to dismantle the tax code and to fund public education, only the backers of the Silver Sea Bill can know. But regardless of their intent, Senate Bill 509 would devastate our economy, bankrupt our state, cripple our schools, and it cannot 
to come along. This disastrous provision is just another example of what happens when legislation is driven by political gamesmanship rather than thoughtful, transparent policy making. Missourians know that I have never opposed, been opposed to making responsible changes to the tax code. In fact, I've cut taxes four times as government, and Missouri now has the sixth lowest taxes in the nation. But deeply flawed and disastrous measures like Senate Bill 509 have real consequences. And that's why when it comes to the tax code, these changes must be considered in a serious, meticulous, and thoughtful way. Unfortunately, over the past few months, some members have turned the legislative process into a race to see how many tax bills they can put on my desk in as short a period as possible. That is not the right approach. It doesn't produce good policy, as we see here today. It is, quite frankly, dangerous to our state. For generations, Democrats and Republicans have worked together to protect Missouri's spotless AAA credit rating and keep our state on a fiscally responsible path. Now is not the time to veer off that course. That's why I'm calling my members of the legislature to abandon this dangerous scheme and work with us on a responsible approach, like the one I laid out earlier this year that will protect public education and keep our state moving forward. Now, thank you, and I'd, I'd like to turn over for just a second just to give you a couple quick minutes with uh, Chris Pieper here, and then I'll finish up and be glad to take questions. Uh, to go through a quick analysis, uh, Chris, if you would, uh, the uh, Senior Legal and Policy Advisor, Chris Pieper. Chris. Thank you, Governor. Uh, as you can see, these are these are blowups of uh, an excerpt of Senate Bill uh, 509 and 496, just to walk you through uh, some of the provisions that are at issue. If you see here in 143.011, the subsection one imposes uh, the tax, and then the brackets here instruct how to calculate the amount of the tax. So for various different levels of income that are represented in the brackets, on the left side, moving over to the right side, uh, shows you uh, what rate and how to calculate the tax. The new language in bold here uh, that is added with 509 uh, calls for a reduction in some of the rates, uh, and it also uh, requires, and this is the highlighted language here, that the bracket for income subject to the top rate, that that uh, bracket is eliminated uh, once the uh, uh, tax rate has been reduced to, to 5.5%. If the bracket on the left side is eliminated uh, pursuant to this sentence, then there's a new top bracket. That bracket is for income over $8,000, but not over $9,000. What that does is it means that there is no uh, income tax bracket that applies to income over $9,000, meaning that uh, such taxpayers are not subject to tax at all. Thank you, Chris. As you can see right here in black and white, the problems of this bill are clear and the impact will be dramatic, affecting every basic public service in every corner of our state and shaping our economy. Missourians deserve better. With a few weeks left in the legislative session, it's time for the General Assembly to set aside these misguided schemes and fiscal experiments and work together on policies that will help our economy rather than hurt it. With that, I'd be glad to take any questions. So why are this bill is so bad? Why aren't you here yesterday? Clearly, this bill can't become law, but we're going to take the time afforded us in the days ahead to com complete our analysis and communicate with folks about the problems that are here. Sounds like there's enough analysis already. It's this bad, it's going to do so much work, so why not go ahead and do so? No. I mean, I've laid out what I'm going to do, and I think that making sure that we're able to communicate not just to, uh, uh, not just uh, in a small fashion, but to make sure that the Missourians understand the import of this decision, uh, it's very important that these legislators here, not just from their leadership, not just from their various vote count whips, but from their constituents about how important the fiscal responsibility of their positions and how the tax code is not something to be played with. Well, Brendan Gale said this morning, uh, he used the word laughable three or four times, and your analysis is laughable, but all you're trying to do is be scare tactics that you're not even reading all of subparagraph four you're only picking out part of it, and reading all of subparagraph four clearly gives the Revenue Department the authority to fix the line 22 and take away the that's 8,000 and above the tax bracket, not just not. I mean, that's three or four different subjects to talk about there, but it would strike me as extremely odd that the legislature would want the Department of Revenue to write the tax laws in the state. Um, this is the tax law of our state. They have a responsibility to write those clearly 
and not make an excuse that some bureaucrat should have to clean up after them. If this is, if you're correct, if they're saying that this is an example of incompetence at your Department of Revenue, which analyzed this bill for its fiscal impact with this one, and never brought up this issue with this language and the fiscal note um, response that they provided I mean, to the legislature. This is not about playing the game of gotcha. This is black and white. This is a bill that's been truly agreed to finally passed. It is on my desk. My signature would make it law. This is not about some sort of cat chasing its tail as to who to blame who for what, where. We are at this point in history because the House didn't want to take any amendments and they wanted to put this bill on my desk very quickly. This bill and the direct language of this bill crashes a giant hole in the future of this state. And, and who was around or, or who missed what or all that sort of stuff is merely a distraction from the core issue as to whether or not folks should play games with the tax code of the state of Missouri or whether we should work together to responsibly deal, as has been done in the past, with the fiscal issues of the state. Okay, so, so, so Mr. President, Deal offered an opinion written by former Missouri Supreme Court Judge Ray Price, in which um, Judge Price said that the court would never allow the absurd result of eliminating the top tax bracket. They would look at the language, they would look at the, at the result of, of that, and they would say, but the intent was that, there, that the taxes would remain in place only a lower rate. Language clear. I end up. Uh, but, um, um, you know, a couple things. I mean, uh, some might want to read the street decision uh, in that particular matter. But language is clear. Uh, my job is not to speculate about how some judge might rule someday but to read what the bill actually says. Some folks may be willing to gamble the finances and future of our state in the hopes that a judge will rule their way. I am not. If this provision wasn't in the bill, would you sign it? I don't know. I, I've said all along, I, the, the, and you all follow me carefully, that, that uh, sign for tax cuts, they need to be directly tied to create jobs and, and focused on on being affordable. Um, Governor, what did, yeah. what, did your, what did your administration know there were problems? There was I mean, bill, well, the, bill, the bill, once the bill got to here, bill review late, late last week, um, um, we became aware uh, as we began the review process, um, either late that night or next There was no communication from the Revenue Department, from the Budget Planning Office, that that sentence could create this problem? I, I don't know. I know that when the bill was rushed through the House and sent to the desk, sent it to my, my office, late that night and our folks began the process of reviewing it because we were put on a pretty quick time frame there. Um, and and at, during the initial stages of that review, it was very, very clear uh, that there was a provision here that eliminates taxes over $9,000 income tax. There's, there's still another bill floating around out here that they could change. I think they got more than one. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but on this subject, if the legislature wanted to rework that paragraph to alleviate your questions about it, how would you suggest they word that so that it's not the problem you bring up? Well, I mean, I, it's relatively easy to fix it if you're just working on the draft, and I think the substantive uh, underlying issues are significant. Um, but there, there are clearly ways to uh, to do what they wanted to do in, in a way that that did not have this uh, have this uh, problem. Uh, but that's uh, you know, there are lots of ways. You know, I, I, I don't not to. Uh, not at this point, I'm going to go through and get pencil and say what words and go where. Um, but I think we just, everybody needs to take a big deep breath here. And we got four weeks to go. And early in the session, uh, quite frankly, before the session started, a number of occasions, uh, I have, I've expressed strongly my willingness to, to work with these folks uh, in this area. As everybody in this room knows, uh, we presented uh, what we thought was a workable compromise uh, in the first se section of the the session with Senator Krauss. That did not uh, ultimately get uh, passed by the Senate, but I have not been shy about uh, uh, you know whether it's the, the four tax sets I've signed or the willingness to work with these folks. We've not been shy about that, um, to uh, our willingness to work with them. And now is the time that everybody should just take a deep breath, set this bill aside, and get to work on the tasks we have at hand for the last uh, four weeks of the session. Hey, Richard, I'm sure you're referring to our safety. 
Um, what evidence do you have that he was involved in? I didn't say any evidence. I just said that this is exactly what his, that's what he's been trying to do. He wants to get rid of the income tax. That is what he is, not, that's not the hidden thing out there. That's exactly what, what he wants to do. So the fact that that comports with this behavior um, is in this language. Um, like I said, it, I, 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 um, it is, you know, positionally harmonious. Have you, yeah, you said that the, that the House did not want to take any amendments. Would you be crystal clear? Did someone that works for you ask them to change? No, I just I just heard that, that, that when they, when Bill went over to the Senate and I was talking to the left side guys, they said uh, uh, no amendments, take it up and go. Did they not see the error? I mean, they've been in the room. When we had a lot of questions with Bill. How did they not see that five years ago? I don't know. They just I, I just. You have to read bills in order to ascertain problems. You know, I mean, it's, it's the Department of Revenue that ultimately is going to interpret how this is applied. And I mean, no, it's not the courts will, well, David. Well, right. Ultimately, if you got $4.8 billion on the table, you can't expect $4.8 billion out there for people not to be litigating about it. This is going to fly its way through any sort of, any sort of governmental interpretation and head to the courts you know, very, very quickly. And that's just not the way to run a state. To say that 97% that, that of the income tax and 65% of your general revenue is instantaneously going to be involved in trying to prove with the courts that the words shall be eliminated don't mean shall be eliminated. That's a waste of everyone's time, energy, and effort. And anybody making excuses that somebody over at the Department of Revenue should fix all these problems, that's just a smokescreen, folks. I mean, for, for what needs to be done here, which is responsible legislation. It's so that simple. The start out as the basic interpretation that would be challenging for it. Would you have them start out with the interpretation that it's a $4.8 billion tax cut or that's a $620 million tax cut? Those are two separate. I mean, the, the, once the bill got to my desk and we began to <coughs> this obvious problem became real. We did exactly what I said. Uh, went through an analysis of it, sought additional folks to look at it that are experts in this area, had budget planning look at it, and that leads us, and we had like holidays, and that led us to today. So we've been in real time. Um, you know, I, when, when the, if the legislature were to pass a bill that would come law that says, shall be eliminated, I don't know why we would tell a government agency not to eliminate that. Have you reviewed the bill, have you found any other problems that already were reviewed? I mean, let's I said, the, the overall concept of these experimental tax cuts that especially help, you know, the, 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 the most wealthy in our in our uh, in our society, um, have, you know, is something that that is troubling, obviously, and especially when you get to these amounts. Um, but this this particular egregious error uh, uh, has been the focal point of my attention on the last three or four days. You don't have a summer this time around to drum up external pressure on these people not to sustain the Open that. You have about two weeks. Do you have enough time to change people's mind and avoid an overrun? Uh, I think clearly that uh, once once you get through the the kind of the uh, the initial um, you know uh, um, quick um, oh my golly we couldn't make it. Error of this magnitude. I and mean, once folks get the chance to look at this and understand the magnitude of what we're dealing with here, uh, my sense is that uh, uh, reasonable minds will uh, will uh, accommodate. I mean, you're going to Columbia tonight. What other plans do you have to communicate your concerns with the lower I, I'm, I'm, I've to got it. busy night tonight. I've got that, and obviously, a uh, uh, very difficult responsibility. Have you put the expansion on the back burner by the practice? No, I mean, we can, we're can. we fully capable of uh, engaging at myriad of levels, uh, and you'll see us continue to, uh, to to press on that issue, which I think uh, I think we are making progress on. Have you spoken to Representative Orr? He's your Democrat, so he's I've not personally talked to Jeff, no. Have you asked your staff? I mean, they reach out to him at all? Have you been we're in constant contact with lots of members of the legislature. I'm confident that our folks have had a chance to uh, to visit with Jeff. Well, I'm speaking of tonight, rather than yeah. speaking of tonight's execution, rather than waiting for a statement an hour or an hour, can you tell us if you're going to deny coming to the United States? The courts are still, the matter's still in the courts, and, and I, I'll meet with the council after this. We'll, we'll, uh, 
I think when my time frame is over, I'll say quickly David, and I want to make sure that I get a final review with the council on the clemency decision before we make any, any final decisions. Yeah. I ask, I ask you for a clarification on something that you said a few days ago, and you, we've gotten some questions about it. When you're talking about the bond issue and unnecessary projects in the bond issue, are you talking about both? Because it's in the bond issue. How was any of my comments ever not clear that the primary thing that we need to do as far as capital this year is to rebuild the Fulton State Hospital that was built in 1851 and needs to be rebuilt? Clearly, I mean, I laid out a bond proposal on that. It's in my state of the state. I've had countless meetings with significant members of the legislature about that. I've stated time and time and time again, this is the year to get that done. And anyone that has not had the ability to uh, to hear that, I'll be glad to say it one more time. So you're okay with bonds for Fulton, but you question some of the other law and list projects that are on the bond issue bill at the center? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I haven't, you know, we've got some sessions coming up, but I mean, I, the, 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 the laundry list there was, was, was a tad long, and some of those projects uh, were ones that were already in the way, you know, uh, it, it would appear. So, I mean, I think that when you're talking about bonding, you shouldn't do it for things that have already been, the money's already been appropriated. So, I mean, but we're, we're, we're uh, looking forward to continuing to work with the legislature on those uh, those matters. I mean, I, like I said, I've talked about, I've been talking about bonding for a number of years uh, as an opportunity here, and I think it's especially important to look at that for Fulton, and if there are other projects that fit within that zone that are good investments for the state that we should move forward on, uh, I look forward to working with members of both the House and Senate to come up with a, a, a solid list. Will there be any retribution if any House Democrats votes over it? Be, I mean, uh, I, I am focused on fiscal fiscal responsibility of the positions that I have here, and you know, uh, I, this is this is just about the process of people understanding what a significant mistake this is, and how important it is that we set this bill to the side, and that and that we move in a in a uh, in a in a more responsible direction. So there are because I mean, there's no change here. It's not my sense that this bill should have come off. Is any tax credits bill, tax cuts bill, that does not include tax credit reform dead on arrival? Well, as I said before, Bob, I mean, I signed the military retirement pension in 2009. I signed the franchise tax phase out in 2010. I signed the small business job subsidy in 2012. I, I signed the manufacturing corporate income tax apportionment in 2013. Uh, we had good discussions and a proposal with, with, with Senator Kraus uh, early on. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, I would prefer, obviously, that we get uh, for programs, especially with the, the continuing proof that keeps coming in about the inefficiencies of those tax credit programs, that those were on the table during our discussions. Um, but but uh, you know, I'm prepared to take a holistic approach as we uh, as we enter this last month. Number one more. But tomorrow, our school committee is going to have a hearing on free impeachment resolutions. Any thoughts on that? Does anyone in the administration justify? I, I don't know if they will. I, it, it, uh, <clears throat> My order on the joint income tax filing was based on reserve statutes that say that we should follow the federal rules, regulations, and laws. When the IRS issued regulations in this area, um, I thought the best thing for us to do is to follow the Missouri law. If members of the legislature have problems with that, rather than some sort of show, uh, they should go about the legislative work of amending that cons that that that, uh, um, that statute, which clearly, as I laid out, uh, both at the time I did it as well as subsequent to that, was the basis of that. So the fact that they want to Heighten the attention around uh, that issue zone uh, uh, is uh, is their is 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 their choice. Um, but uh, if they were serious about what they were talking about, they would have been moving forward uh, an amendment to the statute, uh, which that opinion is based. Thank you all.